Welcome to the Veritas Forum, engaging university students and faculty in discussions about life's hardest questions and the relevance of Jesus Christ to all of life. Thank you very much. I, I was going to say that I'm humbled to be here, but now I'm really humbled <laughs> to be here. Uh, so that, that actually, actually was, was a, a really fitting introduction, so I appreciate that. Um, I really appreciate all the work that's been done to organize this. I did none of the work. I just showed up here this morning, and uh, I'm just speaking tonight. So it's very easy for me, but there's a lot of people who have put in a lot of work, and I, I deeply appreciate it. Uh, and so what I'd like to do is tell you a little bit about nanotechnology going on in our group. And today I'm going to start with nanotechnology from uh, the side of nanocars. I'm going to talk about that today and then talk about how I came to faith in Jesus Christ. Tomorrow I'm going to be giving a lecture in the afternoon. I believe it's at 2 o'clock. I'm, I'm not sure, but I think it's at 2 o'clock. No, th that's a different talk. I have an 11 o'clock talk with some students, but I have a 2 o'clock talk. Thank you, though. I have a 2 o'clock talk with, uh, uh, I'm going to be speaking to science and engineering, and I'll be talking about some of our work on graphene as well as uh, carbon for medicinal applications. Okay, so let's begin with nanotechnology. And uh, I, have to, I drive here, I think, right? Okay. So this is an overview of some of the different areas that we're working on in our group. And... Uh, uh, we work on, on composite materials, and we've worked on, on uh, composites for the space shuttle that have uh, gone through space approval. Uh, this is an astronaut working on one of the surface materials in space, but not really because that's not really a microwave gun. That's just a water gun that I photoshopped in. They wouldn't show me the real microwave gun because it's proprietary. So we actually developed the composite to work with a microwave gun, and they won't show me the microwave gun. Because it's proprietary. Work on carbon fibers, uh, collaborate some with Dr. Satish Kumar, who's here. Um, we, we work on carbon nanotubes. This is a roach leg that we converted into graphene, a uh, single sheet of, of carbon by heating it up to 1,000 degrees on a copper foil, because roaches are made out of carbon just like we are, and you just restructure it differently, and you can make, make uh, graphene out of it. Um, we work on, on uh, radome coatings that didn't show up. Uh, we work on uh, a lot of things for the oil and gas industry to make things more efficient. Uh, we've made, just this past year, we made transparent and visible mem memory so you could have embedded within glass and flexible pl plastic. Not just a conductive touchscreen display, but also the memory is now, can now be embedded in that, so we work on the, in that area. We do a fair amount on the medicinal side. Tomorrow I'll be talking about uh, uh, carbon for traumatic brain injury and stroke, uh, some of the hottest drugs, hottest drug that's ever been seen for this area. And uh, we work on capturing radioactive elements uh, from the environment to clean up legacy sites. And, and uh, we work on also, uh, I'll be talking about this tomorrow, where we can take a single sheet of graphene and grow nanotubes seamlessly out of the graphene. Uh, but with that, that's the overview of what we do. And here's what I'm going to talk a little bit about tonight. And these are nanocars. Here's a picture of one of our nanocars. This is from Zeitz magazine in Germany. We sent them a picture of one of our nanocars. And you see the four wheels of the nanocar here, and it's 9.4 times 10 to the minus 24 kilograms. That's a, uh, I, I don't have to pe tell people at tech how small that is. That's a really small number. But in case there's anybody here who doesn't go to Georgia Tech and has never had the pleasure of, of studying at Georgia Tech, uh, that's like 24 zero point and then, you know, 24 zeros and a 9.4 or something like that. It's a very small number. This is 280,000 kilograms. So after I show you about nanocars, I'll discuss why we might want to make these when we can already have these. And a human being stands about that high relative to this vehicle. It's used in coal mining. Uh, so we make nanocars, but we make lots of these. To give you an idea of how many we make of these, uh, in a single re reaction flask, we make 10 to the 23rd at a time, which you know is a big number. Let me put this in perspective. One swallow of water is 18 milliliters. 18 milliliters of water is one mole of water. One mole of water is six times to the 23rd molecules. If instead of having 
one swallow of water. If we, we put this, say, with sheets of paper. If one had sheets of paper and say you had a stack of paper that's 500 sheets high, you stick it in your inkjet printer, and that's two and a half inches high. Instead of having 500 sheets of paper, you had six times 10 to the 23rd sheets of paper or a mole of paper. That stack of paper reaches from the earth to the sun 400 million times. So a mole is a big number. We make this a mole at a time. So we have many of them and we'll capitalize on the many. This is how we make nano cars. This was our fourth generation nano car. And we start with orthobromo aniline. We, we iodinate, put a TMS acetylene on, and we build up the structure in this way. And then we go ahead and build up the axles. And then we put on the fullerene wheels. And so what you'll notice about this nano car, it's the same top and bottom. This was designed in, so it doesn't matter how it lands on a surface, the front and the back forward and reverse is the same, so it doesn't matter which direction it would start going. We call this the Z nano car because when I, when I was in high school, I wanted, and only a few of you are going to remember this, I wanted a, a Datsun 240Z. <laughs> and, and I never was able to get one. <clears throat> but when you design your own car, you can name it whatever you like. So we <laughs> named this the Z car, and it kind of looks a little bit like a Z. But this was our fourth generation car, so it has fully rotatable axles. And also, the, 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 the axles can rotate 360 degrees relative to the chassis due to these, these single bonds here. And this is important. My sons, when they <clears throat> were growing up, they had these cars where the axle could spin 360 degrees relative to the chassis. You know, these are little electric cars. And that helps them climb up steps. And we needed the same thing here, so we built that feature into these as well. So this is what they look like uh, on an atomically smooth surface. And, and again, I, I, I've lost the resolution in the, in the, uh, in the PC to the Mac conversion here. Uh, but, but anyway, so he, here's, they, they actually look much better. They, this, this surface should be covered just like this. And um, uh, they're facing in this direction. They're going to turn and move across here. They're 3 nanometers by 2 nanometers. And this is... <clears throat> This is important. We built them as, as rectangles. And we built them as rectangles because we can tell then the directionality. Which direction are they moving? Because if we didn't build them as a rectangle, if they were a square, we wouldn't know which direction they're going. So this is actually going to turn and move across this surface. OK, so they're starting to move here. There it is. And really, the resolution on a PC would have been a whole lot better. But uh, there it is. And there's the first nano collision ever recorded right there. <laughs> and, and so this is on atomically smooth gold. Now, many people had said that when we started doing this, this would be like a car on ice. It would have no directionality. It's just going to slide. That turns out not to be the case. We were very fortunate it didn't turn out to be the case because subsequently we made other nano cars where that occurred, and then we understood what we had to do to have the equivalent of friction at the nano level. And the, the, uh, a fullerene gives about a 2 EV bond strength. That's about 45 kilocalories per mole per fullerene to the gold surface. And because of that, these roll rather than slide across the surface. And we furthermore know that because when we built the trimer of this nano car, when we built this trimer, it only rotates, it only pivots on axis. So if these were like a car sliding on ice, these just slide just as well. But they don't. Only the, the four-wheeled ones translate. These pivot on axis. And uh, uh, so it's, 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 um, it's a feature that we built in. So we know that these are translating. We can watch them translating. Once they get going, they continue in that direction. Uh, here's where you see a feature of the suspension, where it goes up one atomic step on the gold. These are one atomic step of high islands and comes back down the other side. And that's, that's a feature of that, um, uh, uh, of the, the axles relative to the chassis. You know, many people said you don't have a nano car until you have a motor. So we had to build in a motor. Uh, and so we built in these motors. And the idea is that these motors would act as, as a rotator, which would push these along like a paddle wheel. And the reason that these rotate in only one direction when you shine light on them 
is because they have a stereogenic center right here. So there's two ele elements of, of isomerism here. There's the atrope isomerism, the twisted double bond, and then there's a chiral or stereogenic center right there. So when this is, is photolyzed, it goes to an orthogonal state. And once it's in this orthogonal state, it can relax either way back down. But because of the nearby stereogenic center, those two orthogonal states can go in, in, in diastereotopic over diastereotopic transition states. That means different energy transition states. So it keeps going over the lower energy side, and it rotates in one direction. And so we built that feature into the nanocar. So this is how we did it. We start with these small molecules and build it on up. And, and we make first the rotor. We make the stator. And then we couple them together to make the motor. Then we put these end groups on to stick them onto these axles. And then we assemble the nanocar. Now this nanocar has a 3 megahertz rotation. So you shine light on it. It spins 3 million rotations per second. So this is something that you can't get out of a macroscopic motor, but there are these sort of features that can be built in. So we have these cars, we have motors, we've built about 25 different models of vehicles. We've built nano back hose that can grab an element. We've built nano trucks that have a loading bay of a porphyrin loading bay to be able to carry things. But then the question comes, why nano cars? Why do we want to do them? At a place like Georgia Tech, what are they good for? Well, what is this good for? What is Mona Lisa good for? <laughs> what does Mona Lisa do? Right? What does it do? It's aesthetically pleasing. It makes us happy when we look at it. We wonder, is she looking at me or isn't she? What was, what was Leonardo da Vinci thinking when he spent his life working on this? In academia, we don't have to have an application. We can do something just because it's intellectually interesting, and we should never forget that. This is what the academy is for. This is what funding should be for, that we can do things that are just intellectually pleasing. And this is intellectually pleasing. Nonetheless, these certainly have applications. So for example, you look at a tree. This tree was made from the bottom up so that we as people, if we want to make a podium, what do we do? We go out, we find a tree, we cut it down, we build a podium. That's top-down fabrication. That's generally how we build. Everything is nat in nature is built from the bottom up if it has complex assembly. And in order to be a complex design, in order to be a thinking person, in order to, order to be an insect, in order to be able to, to have logic and intelligence and thought and function, one has to have disordered assembly. A rock, A, B, A, B, a stone, a, a mineral, A, B, lined up, or, or, or A, 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 all lined up. This is simple structure. You can get that by thermodynamics. You can get assembly like that. A, B, A, B. You can get that sort of assembly. But you have to have disordered, non-regular assembly in order to have complex function. This is what we are. We have all sorts of different pieces that work together. And how does nature do this if you can't just do it spontaneously by thermodynamics, by having molecules assemble into higher order structures like this? You do it with machines. And in nature, it's done with nanomachines, which are called enzymes, where it takes certain molecules and puts them into place so that the, the bagel that you ate this morning becomes part of your ear this evening. How does that happen? The molecules are broken down, and they're assembled in other places that they need to be assembled into. The breaking down is by enzymes, and the enzymes reconstruct. That is nature's nanomachines. If we want to be able to build sophisticated structures ex vivo, outside of the body. I don't think that these are going to be good for in the body because these are really small, 2 nanometers by 3 nanometers. This is plankton to a white blood cell. This is very small. But we're going to have to be able to assemble. If we're going to use it in vivo, we're going to use things that look like enzymes. They work quite well. But ex vivo, where enzymes don't work very well, then we have to be able to have structures that can build things. So can we begin to be able to pick things up and do assembly? Can we be able to pick things up and have higher order assembly constructed before our very eyes? This happens biologically. Enzymes do this. We are ubiquitous going around and, and, and there's this construction. You look at the trees out there, they've been made the same way. All of this. Well, can we build buildings like this so that in 100 years or 200 years we build skyscrapers this way? Could it be? Or is this just all science fiction? Don't dismiss it. Because everything in nature 
that has complex function is built this way with nature's little nano machines. Can we program nano cars to assemble so that instead of building buildings like this, as we've been building for the last 5,000 years where we bring in bricks and sticks and mortar, can we just bring in raw materials and have cars just assemble it? This is what enzymes do. This is how that tree formed, not from some larger tree being cut down, but from the bottom up. And the sophistication in a tree or a blade of grass is more than the, the, the technological sophistication in this building. Some strains of grass grow two feet tall in a single day. So actually, you can do bottom-up assembly quite quick, quickly. You look at the growth rate of a carbon nanotube. Very fast growth, but that's regular assembly. So look at DNA, the growth rate of DNA. Extremely rapid assembly. These things can occur very rapidly. This is what we want to do. This is what we envision with nanocars. If we can learn to understand motion, if we can learn to control that motion, which we've done with electric fields, electric field gradients, if we can learn then to program them with electric fields to pick something up and drop it off, well, what will we make initially? Well, we'll just pick up 50 atoms and drop it off in a pile, and that will be a quantum dot memory, one bit. But that's a construction. We start small and then start building up smaller structures from there. So that it, could it be in 100 years or 200 years that we would use nanocars to build in that very way, just as enzymes do, because there is nothing magical about biology. It is sophisticated, it is complex, but we can understand it. And can we start to mimic it without using the tools of biology, using other tools, other tricks that we have and design other structures to build buildings, things that we like to live in. So that's nanocars. So there is the summary of different features that we've built. We've built motors and sensors and actuators. We've built in actually suspension, directionality, all different kinds of wheels, different fuel sources. We have chemically powered motor cars. We have thermally powered. We have light powered. We have uh, different cargo transporters. So all of these features have been built in. But what I'd like to do now is to tell you, first of all, how I became interested in chemistry. I didn't grow up <laughs> becoming interested in chemistry. What happened to me? What was the transition that I went through to, to be in the position that I am today? How did I become interested in chemistry? And I wanted to be a New York State trooper. That's what I wanted to be. When I was in high school, I just, just had this vision. I wanted to be a New York State trooper. But it turned out that I couldn't get into the academy and I couldn't get into the academy because I was, I'm colorblind. And I don't know what the rules are today. I suspect you could be a paraplegic and become a state trooper these days. <laughs> but at the time, you couldn't be colorblind and become a state trooper. And so I thought I'd go into criminal science, work in a crime lab, at least somehow be related to, to, to that sort of, of field. But my father gave me some advice. He said, why don't you instead of going into criminal science, why don't you just get an undergraduate degree in chemistry, and then you can specialize after that. And I don't know what came over me, being 17 or 18 years old, but I listened to my father. <laughs> and and uh, uh, it actually turned out to be really good advice, because then I found organic synthesis. As a sophomore organic chemistry student, I started falling in love with synthetic chemistry. I would sit on Friday evenings when everybody else was out doing other things, and I would just solve problems in the book that had never been assigned. <laughs> and then I started going beyond that and taking graduate textbooks and trying to solve the synthetic problems in there. Just, I loved doing organic synthesis, and I thought, this is wonderful. It's just uh, uh, wonderful to do this. And so I, I went to graduate school, and, and, and I started uh, pursuing a, a field in chemistry. So this is how I became a chemist. But uh, now I want to share with you how I became, how I came to faith in Jesus Christ. Now, I just want to say I'm not a theologian and I'm not a philosopher. And most Veritas forums bring in philosophers and theologians. And if they're not philosophers and theologians, they're very well read in those areas. I've read nothing in those areas. I don't know anything about theology, and I don't know anything about philosophy. So if you come here and you're going to have questions about some, what some great philosopher has said, I'm just going to have to trust you that they said that, because I can't verify that. I don't know. And don't, 
if, if you throw at me terms that, that are philosophical terms, I'm just going to look starry-eyed. I just don't know that area. Um, uh, so, so I'm just a simple chemist. That's what I am, all right? <laughs> <clears throat> this was the first verse that I ever read from the Bible that I ever thought about. I was, 19, I was 18 years old. I had just gone to college. I had just turned 18. I was a freshman in college. <clears throat> and it was in August of my freshman year. I was in the laundry room doing my first load of laundry there in college, and there was another young man in there, and we got to talking, and he was, uh, he was a year ahead of me. I was a freshman. He was a sophomore. He was on the Syracuse University football team as a quarterback, a, I don't know, like a third-string quarterback, and I said, what do you want to do when you get done with school? Uh, you want to play professional football? He says, oh, no, I'm not good enough for that. I said, well, what do you want to do? He says, oh, well, maybe lay ministry. Well, to give you an idea of my background, I am from a secular Jewish home, born in New York City, and I didn't know what lay ministry was. And uh, I said, what's lay ministry? I've never heard of that. He said, oh, like a missionary? It's missionary. We don't need missionaries today. This is 1977. <laughs> Why do we need missionaries today? We've got TV. TV can do everything. <clears throat> And uh, he told me he wanted to give me an illustration of the gospel. So I'm going to tell you some of the very things that he told me. He says, do you mind me giving you an illustration? I thought he was going to draw me a picture. I said, sure. And he had me read a verse from the Bible, and this was the first verse. And he had me read it. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And when I read this verse, I looked at him and I said, I'm not a sinner. And he was a bit taken back by that. Now, Sin is not something that secular Jews in New York think about. This is, was never, ever a topic in our home. We never discussed sin. We never discussed God. We never discussed any of this. We went to, uh, you know, as far as sin is concerned, as far as I knew, you know, you go to synagogue once a year and, and the rabbi <laughs> takes care of all of that. And we never really thought about it. At least I never did. And then lo and behold, I understood Christians. Every thought, uh-oh, <laughs> sinned. I mean, everything is, 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 is constructed around this. But it was a new concept to me, and I, and I, and I said, uh, I'm not a sinner. And he looked a bit bewildered, and he had me read another verse. But I, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And I read this verse. And it was as if a knife had been stabbed right in my heart. Because when I was 14 years old, I started working in a, in a gas station on the highway going in and out of New York City. There was one on each side of the road by the same owner, and it worked both sides. I told the owner I was 16. I was 14 years old. He, they didn't check paperwork back at those, in, those ta in those days. And uh, I guess many don't check paperwork anymore. But... Um, but I learned that when I cleaned the parking lots on Friday nights that I could find an amazing stash of pornographic magazines as the salesmen on their way home on Friday nights would throw them out. And I became addicted to pornography at a young age, at the age of 14, and by the time I was 18, I was well addicted. And I didn't think anybody knew that. And then this man named Jesus Christ said something 2,000 years ago that just zeroed right in on my heart. And for any of you who have ever been or, or are addicted to pornography, the, in my day, at that time, there was no internet. It's much easier now to get addicted to it. You understand how compelling that can be. And I couldn't get this off my mind. Then he had me read another verse. But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I didn't even know that there was a claim on the table that Christ died for me. You would think that someone growing up in the United States, born and raised in New York, would have heard this somewhere. And I'm sure that I heard it on some TV program. I remember when I was working in the gas station, people would come in and give me a little tract sometimes, and I'd sit on the night shift and read these sometimes. But nothing ever registered. But all of a sudden, after reading this verse and then this verse, Somebody died for me. 
And then I read that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And what an odd verse. That if I confess with my mouth Jesus is Lord, well, that's pretty simple to do, but believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. Who could believe in a physical resurrection? Who could believe in such a thing? How could any thinking man or woman ever believe in a physical resurrection? Were it not for the case that it's true, and God has set it in the hearts of men and women to believe that very truth, could that be? Could it be? I was living at the time in that room, <laughs> room 1812 of the Lawrence Dormitory on the Syracuse University campus. And then on November 7th, 1977, so a couple months after I had heard this, that word still was penetrating into my heart. And I don't know to this day what motivated me to do this. This is something that had never been demonstrated to me in Christianity or in Judaism. I got down on my knees and I said, Father, forgive me because I'm a sinner. I'm just telling you what I did. It's a very simple story. At that moment, it was as if somebody was in my room. I was all alone. My roommate wasn't there. And I remember opening my eyes because I felt somebody was in my room. And I didn't see anyone. But somebody was there. And all of a sudden, there was this rush of cleansing over me and this feeling of conviction that I had about that lust in my heart from pornography it just went away. And I started weeping. What a strange experience for some Jewish kid from New York City to read a few verses. And I didn't want to get up because I loved the presence of whoever was in my room. Something happened to me and I didn't know what I was going to do, what I was going to say. And I remember a couple weeks later, this young man who had shared these few verses with me looked at me one day, a couple weeks after this event, I didn't tell anybody. What's this kid from New York going to say, this Jewish kid? What am I going to do? And he said to me, Jim, have you asked Jesus into your heart? I said, I think I have. Why do you ask? He said, you haven't stopped smiling for weeks. <laughs> Something is different. And I sure felt different. Something happened to me on that day. And I'll tell you the other thing that happened to me on that day, which is really remarkable. There was no longer any hold of pornography old, over me. All of my magazines went in the trash, and never, all of these years, has pornography been, a trouble for, been trouble for me again. Now, this is very unusual. I have seen many men come to faith. I did prison ministry in a maximum security prison for 10 years, worked with many men with many struggles. It is very rare that somebody on the day of salvation gets delivered in this way. But what's interesting, is that I was convicted of my sin through pornography. And on the day that I received Jesus, something changed in me. Now I'll tell you what happened in my career as a result. So some of the results, and exper uh, 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 results of that experience and decision to follow Jesus Christ. We'll look at my career, what happened. The results of the decision that I made to follow Jesus. What happened in my life as a result? I was striving to overcome sin. Something that I had never worried about before, I was striving to overcome sin. I had a lot of struggles on that day that took years to work through, some that I still, still deal with now, but it affects me. That's something that never happened to me before. It started affecting me, and I wanted to do what was right. Just from that event, from that day, that event, that started to change in my life. I started reading the Bible every day. Every day, I started reading the Bible. So I read the Bible today. My pattern is this. I start in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. And I read through to Revelation chapter 22. When I'm done, I start again. And I just pick up where I start, stopped reading the day before. And I've been doing this for over 30 years. And I'm not in any hurry. I don't do it once a year. Where, wherever I am, I, I just pick up and read. And when I feel God speaking to me, I just... Read it over and over again. I'm in no hurry. But I just start reading it over and over again, and I love it. Just love it. 
I started seeking like-minded friends. You know, I started seeking people that, that were like-minded. And I joined a church, and I was really mentored by godly men, people that I really respected. You know, this whole idea of mentoring, we believe it in the, in the academic realm. You know, I'm mentoring 20 graduate students and 10 postdocs right now. We believe in this in the academic world. But how about in the social world and faith-based world and emotional world? And so I started meeting men that I thought, boy, it'd be nice to be more like this person. They seem to have their act together. And I started praying that God would provide me with a wife that he had for me. I realized that was going to be a pretty important decision. And I started to pray for it. And then, this is a big thing that's going to apply to many of you. I actively started praying for God's blessing upon my studies. I was struggling in freshman chemistry. I really was. I was never very smart, never very good. And, and uh, you know, my, my sister was just one of these people who was off the charts in everything. I mean, 800 SATs, everything. And one of those sisters. And then I had a brother, you know, uh, uh, that was my older sister, my older brother, and she's now head of, of Microsoft Research. Um, and after she served for many years as a professor at UCLA. Um, my brother was one of these guys that always did well and never had to work very hard. Now he's a lawyer. <laughs> I don't know what that means. I mean, if, if I were at a different institution, nobody would have laughed. But <clears throat> I was struggling with freshman chemistry because I was dropped into the honors courses because they felt I was a chemistry major, so I ought to be in there. I needed to be in with the masses, just the regular people. I started praying about my work. I ended up graduating, that, getting out of that semester with a B-plus in freshman chemistry. After that, I took so much chemistry that I took every graduate course in organic chemistry as an undergraduate and was at the top of every one of the classes. God really blessed my work. And go figure, God answers prayer. Really amazing. This is something I started to experience. I'll show you, give you lots of examples from this. So there was this admonition to change my words and my actions. This is the impact upon my career. I was moved to change my words and my actions because of studying of the scriptures. I'll give you an example. It says in Proverbs 3, verse 3 and 4, Do not let kindness and truth leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart, so you will find favor and good repute in the sight of God and men. This transcends faith. I don't care what your faith is. You do this. You don't let kindness and truth leave you. You bind it around your neck. Write it on the tablet of your heart. You're going to find favor in the eyes of many other people. If you speak honestly and you do the right thing, this will serve you very well in your career. As a result, I started to change the words that I use. Even to this day, when I'm going into a hard meeting, and I know I'm ready to, you know, because I am a type A person, I, you know, God checks me. Don't let kindness and truth leave you. Bind it around your neck. Write it on the tablet of your heart. You know, I know when I'm, I'm, I'm writing a sharp email because my fingers start pounding really hard. And I have to back off. Thank you so much for doing this. You are so valuable to this institution. Gets me a lot of points with people <laughs> by doing this. The things that I do. Let me talk about software. <clears throat> when I started as an assistant professor, I got my first computer, first desktop computer. It was a great computer, state of the art. It was a Mac SE with one megabyte of RAM. I mean, <laughs> it had all of this memory. What are you going to do with one megabyte? It was great. <clears throat> and then the next year, they came out with the Mac SE 30. 30 megabytes. You could keep two programs open at the same time. <laughs> and I, I gave that to the students in the lab, and I bought another set of software. And then I, the group started growing. I bought another. My colleagues said, what are you doing? Computers in those days didn't talk to each other. They said, just don't buy another set of software. Just put that set of software for that computer in that one. I said, oh, well, I called the companies, and they said, I can't do that, that I have to use it. And they shook their heads. They said, you're crazy. But I knew this verse, do not let kindness and truth leave you. I couldn't do it. 
I couldn't do it. My colleagues, when they were struggling for grant money, I would have grant program managers call me at the end of the year and say, we got this chunk of extra money. Can you use it? There is great blessing in doing what is right. If I were you, but I'm not, but if I were, I wouldn't want any software on my devices that I didn't own or any music. And I tell my group every year, if there's any software that's drifted onto our computers that we don't own, get rid of it. And if we really need it, let me know, I will buy it. Because I have received so many blessings by being honest. And this is just one area that I think students this, these days can understand. Admonition to value my family. This is an important thing. You think this is a given. Ah, just get married and we'll live happily ever after. You know, if we really love each other, we'll be okay. Well, I work with a lot of students, and I've never known anybody to get married when they didn't love each other. I'm sure it happens sometimes, but generally doesn't happen. So love in itself doesn't make marriages last forever. The scriptures say, let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. This is a very interesting verse. Rejoice in the wife of your youth, that I should treasure my family. Now, I came from a functional home. I didn't come from a dysfunctional home. I had a mother and a father. Now, my father was a nice guy, and I love my father. I still speak with my parents every week. Every Sunday, we speak together on the phone. My parents are both alive. And... and uh, um, but my father did what men do in, the, in that generation. What men did is they put food on the table. They worked hard, put food on the table, and then that's what was expected of a father, and that's what he did. And he did a good job of it. But God was calling me to more. And I learned this through the Scriptures. Train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he's old, he will not depart from it. You know, I read verses like this, and I started investing in the life of my children. And we did things. We did things for this. So, for example, we had family prayer times, daily family prayer times. So I would wake up my kids at 5.30 in the morning. <laughs> did. I do it to this day. We have one kid left at home. He's 17. Still 5.30 in the morning. I wake him up, and my wife and I meet with him, and we read the Bible together, and we pray together, and I'm out of the house by 6. I leave my house at 6 in the morning. And on Saturdays, I sleep in. I don't leave until about 8. And, and uh, but I, So I'd leave normally 6 in the morning, and I'd come home at 6 in the evening. But at 6 in the evening, we'd have dinner together, and then I'd put the kids to bed, starting with the youngest to the oldest, because, where did I learn this? The scriptures. Because of the decision that I made, this changed my career. And this has added enormous balance in my career. Hard work, but I implored God to help me to raise my children because parenting is the hardest task. For anybody who is a parent here, you will understand this. I was just speaking with two other professors today, and we were talking about our children. Just today. First thing, how are your kids? They're talking about, oh, my daughter's this, my son's this. And, and immediately I say, isn't it amazing how much CPU time we devote to wanting our children to do well in life? to wanting their good. You know, you'd think nanocars would consume me and graphene. You know what consumes me? Is the good of my children. This is a precious thing. And you will be all the better of a scientist, of an engineer, if you learn to value your family and treasure them because they will make you much better. On the days when I had great discouragements, my family was there to encourage me. My family was there to stand by me. And many of my colleagues asked me how. This is Rick Smalley, won the 1996 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for the discovery of C60, Buckminster Fullerene. He was a good friend of mine. He used to ask me, how do you do it? How do you do it? Because this, this thing in life of having a family and having children that love you as adult children and having a wife or having a husband that you stay married to the rest of your life is a treasure that people will value around you. doesn't matter how great a scientist they are. They go, wow, how do you do that? The admonition to fear God and keep His commandments. The conclusion, when all has been heard. This is, Solomon wrote this. 
is fear God and keep his commandments because this applies to everyone. If you do what is right, you will go far in your career. If you work honestly and uprightly, you will go far in your career. This is what the scriptures taught me. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, Jesus said. I mean, how simple is that? If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And Jesus said, if you keep my commandments, you'll abide in my love. God will love me if I keep his commandments. This is what I was learning. Just reading the scriptures. I'll give you some applications of the scriptures. This is an event that happened September 3rd, 1993. I'd just gotten tenure. And I was invited back. I got my PhD at Purdue University. And I'd been invited back to give a talk at Purdue. So, so uh, I got tenure very quickly, and, and, and uh, uh, God really blessed my work. And I was praying that morning, and I pray before I give a seminar. Can you believe that? I pray before I give a chemistry seminar. Is that allowed? And, and I prayed that God would really bless it, really bless it. I was just going to be talking about chemistry. I was actually going to be speaking about well-defined oligomers. You, you know, you make them 50, 50 angstroms, 100 angstroms, well-defined, precisely defined oligomers. And as I was praying, I read this verse, th this verse that particular morning, and I was staying in the Purdue Memorial Union and Hotel. Truly I say to you that if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, it will happen. So I said, Lord, you're really raising my faith. I pray it's the best seminar ever in that department, ever. And I said, well, how will I know it's the best? The department's 100 years old. How am I going to know? He said, Lord, if it's the best, I pray that my professor, my mentor, my mentor would say that it was a super seminar. Because every time I brought him a result as a graduate student, no matter how good it was, and some of them were really good, he'd come up to me and say, pretty good, for your level. <laughs> I never got past this man's waist. And so I, I prayed that he would say it was super, something totally out of character for him. So when I got done with this seminar, H. Nagishi, my mentor, who 30 years later, received the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for Palladium Catalyzed Cross-Coupling Reaction. He was sitting right on the front row. And as soon as I got done, he stood up, he raised his hand, he said, Supa! Supa! <laughs> sitting right behind him was H.C. Brown, who won the Nobel Prize in 1979 for the hydroboration reaction. And he was in his 80s at the time, and I stepped off the stage, and I, I stepped off the podium, and I, and, and I went down, and I shook his hand. He was sitting right behind Nagishi, right on the end where he always normally sat. Nobody else sat in that seat. And I said, thank you for coming to the seminar today. He says, I want to tell you something. That was the best seminar I have ever heard in my entire life. And I said, that's very kind of you to say that. And he, in typical Nobel Prize winning fashion, said, I'm not saying it to be kind, I really mean it. <laughs> Here's another application. One time I was upset with a colleague. You ever get upset with a colleague? This colleague was saying things about me to, to other students and, and to undergrads and things. And I knew why he was saying it, because my career had just blossomed. And his career was just was not blossoming. And so I, I went. <laughs> across the hall, knocked on his door, and I was really going to give it to him. And when I knocked, no answer. He wasn't in. And then I had been memorizing this verse with my kids. But I say to you here, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who mistreat you. That's a tough one. That is really a tough one. But as soon as that came to my mind and my heart, I said, okay, fine, Lord, I'll do it. And I would go to the chapel. This is when I, I taught for 11 years at the University of South Carolina. Henry, uh, the the uh, Rutledge Chapel, and I, I w from the time I was an undergraduate, I was always break at noontime, somewhere around the middle of the day, I'd go to the chapel and pray. And I still do that. Is that okay? I still do that. It's allowed, right? I haven't violated any laws, I don't think. So I would go and I would pray, and I said, I will pray for his work every day that God would bless his work, because I am told that I had to bless those and pray for him. And I went and I prayed for him every day. And after about two years, his program got so big and so good and so successful, he got an offer from another university. He accepted the offer, and he left. And I was so happy. <laughs> this really works in helping your career. So let me, 
Let me close out with giving you a few things that I think about. Pondering God in science, seeking to understand. On the left side there is, is, is a cartoon of, a, of, of what we called a molecular computer. And we called it a molecular computer because when I, we had proposed it to DARPA, we called it a, 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 a synthetic brain. And they thought they were going to get in trouble with, with a topic like that. And so, so and it turned out a decade later, they had the synthetic brain project. But we, were, we took a disordered array of molecules, just throw it in there, and then we get voltage pulses from the side and try to program it to do something useful. And my colleagues in engineering and computer science said we could never solve this thing because what you get set up is a series of uh, of nonlinear differential equations, a whole series of them to try to solve this. And my colleagues said it couldn't be solved. And so what I did is I hired two graduate students from computer and applied mathematics, and I never told them that it couldn't be solved. And they solved it. And now I have a position in the computer science department at Rice. <laughs> so I thought a lot about brains and how they work and how they structure. And we worked very hard to get simple gates, AND gates, OR gates. And we, we got NAND there. And, you know, with, with NAND, we, you can do everything. Now you have negation, you can do it all. But very simple systems. And then I'd watch a mosquito come flying around me. And they say, you know, in the brain of that mosquito, tiny little brain, it's far more sophisticated my, than my little hack synthetic brain that I can might maybe get an AND gate, an OR gate, and this mosquito, and I would just watch it. And it would sense I'm there. And it would come, sting, and then release other chemicals to call its friends that there's a hunk of meat here, come. <laughs> Very sophisticated. And then in flight, you go try to hit a mosquito. You got to be pretty fast. I mean, in flight. And how able they are. And I've just read recently how mosquitoes survive in a rainstorm. You'd think they'd all die. They don't. They actually ride the raindrop. They, they ride the raindrop and then flip off it before it lands. It's really amazing. All of that in this little brain. So people think, does science draw me away from God? And it's just the opposite. When I study biological systems, it's like, wow. This to me is so amazing how this happens. It is understandable as we understand more. But it draws me closer to God. When I have a, a two-year-old child come running to me, I'm amazed at how they can walk, how they can think, how they can reason. I try to teach them to speak. My child says, I put it over there. And I want to correct them. No, you put it over there, not put it. But put it is very correct. It's just that in English, with short words, we don't put ED at the end. I will put, I did put, I, it's all the same. But the child is thinking very logically. I put it over there. That's what he should say. I mean, the brain is so amazing. So I see this amazing order, and it causes me to love God all the more. That's what it causes me to do. Again, let me say, I'm not a theologian. I'm not a philosopher. I'm a chemist. I have faith. I love God. It's a simple thing. But I'll answer any questions that you might have. I'll try to. Thank you. A bunch of questions were asked, and the one that was liked the most is as follows. As a Christ follower, and a scientist, do you believe in a literal gen Genesis interpretation of creation? If so, do you believe, do you explain to your colleagues that you don't believe that the origin of life is founded in the theory of evolution? Have you ever had, a, had to choose between the spiritual beliefs and science? I've evolved in my understanding of things or in my, the way I think of things. And let me first start out I don't know how all this occurred because I wasn't there to see it. But it's a fair question, and I'll tell you exactly what I think. I love the scriptures, and I believe the scriptures are accurate. I don't understand what it means by uh, 
by in six days God created the heavens and the earth in the sense that if it were a literal 24-hour days, it's hard for me to understand and to rationalize that. If it were not a literal 24-hour days, then it's easier to understand. In the sense that, if you look, the sun didn't even form until day four. So how is it possible to have a day before the sun has come? Now, if we have an expanding universe, which I think is, is pretty clear that we have an expanding universe, and this has been written about, in, in fact, by Orthodox Jews, that if, as you have an expanding universe, the sense of time changes as the universe expands, and we know that. So something that is, a, is, is one period of time at one segment is a different period of time, and that's why our days are elongating. Each day that we live is longer than the day before. We know that from an expanding universe. Uh, so, it, because the question came to the Genesis account. So I believe that God created a man named Adam, and I believe that he created a woman named Eve. We certainly have evidence of bipedal creatures that predate, you know, anything that, that, uh, that is, is human-like, human, in the sense that they didn't have culture, they didn't have music, they didn't bury their dead. But then somewhere in sub 100,000 years ago, there's evidence that all of a sudden burst on the scene, and it may even be sub 50,000 years, burst in on the scene culture, burying the dead, burying the dead with trinkets and items, musical instruments, all of a sudden burst forth, which are more in line with the time frames of the scriptures. So there were certainly bipedal creatures there, uh, but as far as human as we know it, seem to come much later. And in fact, many estimates are human as we know it with culture is sub 100,000 years. As far as the biological sense, because also there was this question of evolution, I will tell you as a scientist and a synthetic chemist, if anybody should be able to understand evolution, came back. If, any, if anybody should be able to understand evolution, it is me because I make molecules for a living. And I don't just buy a kit and mix this and mix this and get that. I mean, ab initio, I make molecules. I understand how hard it is to make molecules. I understand that if I take nature's toolkit, it can be much easier because all the tools are already there and I just mix it in the proportions that, and I do it, do it under these conditions. And it, but ab initio is very, very hard. I don't understand evolution. And I will confess that to you. Is it okay for me to say that I don't understand this? Is that all right? I know that there's a lot of people out there that don't understand anything about organic synthesis, but they understand evolution. I understand a lot about making molecules. I don't understand evolution. And you would say that, wow, I must be really unusual. Let me tell you what goes on in the back rooms of science. With National Academy members, with Nobel Prize winners, I have sat with them, and when I get them alone, not in public, because it's, it's a scary thing if you, t if you say what I just said. And I say, do you understand all of this, where all of this came from and how this happens? Every time that I have sat with people they, who are synthetic chemists who understand this, they go, uh-uh. Nope. These people are just so far off on how they believe this stuff came together. I have sat with National Academy members and Nobel Prize winners. Sometimes I will say, do you understand this? And if they're afraid to say yes, they say nothing. They just stare at me because they can't sincerely do it. I was once brought in by the, the dean of the department once and many years ago, and he was a chemist, and he was kind of concerned about some things. I said, let me, let me ask you something. You're a chemist. Do you understand this? How do you get... How do you get DNA without a cell membrane? And how do you get a cell membrane without a DNA? And, and how does all this come together from this? He said, Jim, we have no idea. We have no idea. I said, isn't it interesting that you, the dean of science, and I, the chemistry professor, can talk about this quietly in your office, but we can't go out there and talk about this? If you understand evolution, I am fine with that. I'm not going to try to change you, not at all. In fact, I wish I had the understanding that you have. 
but about seven or eight years ago, I posted on my website that I don't understand. And I said, I will buy lunch for anyone that will sit with me and explain to me evolution, and I won't argue with you until I don't understand something. I will ask you to clarify. But you can't wave by and say, this enzyme does that. You got to get down in the details of where molecules are built for me. Nobody has come forth. The Atheist Society contacted me. The Atheist Atheist Society contacted me. They said that they will buy the lunch, and they challenged the Atheist Society, go down to Houston, have lunch with this guy, and talk to him. Nobody's come. <laughs> now remember, because I'm just going to ask, when I stop understanding what you're talking about, I will ask. So I'm, I sincerely want to know. I would like to believe it, but I just can't. Now, I understand microevolution. I really do. We do this all the time in the lab. I understand this, but when you have speciation changes, when you have organs changing, when you have to have concerted lines of evolution all happening in the same place in time, not just one line, concerted lines all in the same place, all in the same environment, this is very hard to fathom. I was in Israel not too long ago talking with a, a bioengineer, talking with a bioengineer and, and Describing to me the, the ear, and he was studying the different changes in the modulus of the ear. And I said, how does this come about? He says, oh, Jim, you know, we all believe in evolution, but we have no idea how it happened. <laughs> you know, there's a good Jewish professor for you. I mean, that's, that's what it is. So that's where I am. Have I answered the question? In your nanocars, you talked about how you use light and heat to spin the molecules. Can you describe that a little better? So, so actually, the heat is needed just for, for the first generation of motor. The, the second generation of motor, which we actually built, the three megahertz motor, the first generation only spin, was spinning 1.8 revolutions per hour. Now, these molecules were first designed by Faringa and not me, and we just built them into the nanocars first. But, okay, so what happens is, is you, you have what are called diastereomers. These are similar-looking structures, but they're different in energy. And all you have to do is set a system to an excited state and give it two options. It can go either way. It can turn back left or turn back right. If you say, if you turn left, it's lower in energy. It's going to go that route almost all the time. If it has a higher energy route, molecules generally go over the lower energy route, as long as you're not giving them so much energy that they populate both. But if you give it just enough energy, it'll keep going over the low energy side. So that's what we do. We, we shine a light on it. That makes them spin halfway. And now they can go back to where they came from or over the lower energy side forward because it's what's called a diastereotopic transition state. It's similar in energy, but necessarily different. And, and uh, uh, that's the best I can do. <laughs> could we actually clear a pathway for people who want to ask questions? Uh, Professor, Tur I, I was wondering, you, you seem to um, have arrived at your beliefs just by reading a few verses and then saying, okay, this works. Um, is that sufficient intellectually for you? Do, you? do you see any good, strong reasons for you believing in Jesus or God? Yeah, th th this is a fair question as well. And... and um you know, I'm not even sure that it was so sophisticated as my reading just a few verses. I mean, it, you know, that's really what I did. I read a few verses and I was convicted of sin. And then I prayed a prayer and something happened to me. So that was an experience. And then if you, an experience is hard to remove from somebody. It was such a profound experience. And that changed me from within. Something that has a stranglehold on me which pornography really did, I was changed on that day. 
That's a profound change in a person's life. A real addiction, it's a profound change. And I, I presume that there's a lot of people in this room that are addicted to pornography, and they know what a stranglehold it has on them. So it, it translated into something quite profound. Then there was also a change in me where when I did wrong, it really meant something now. I was different. Before I could tell a lie, it wasn't a big deal. It's just a little lie, you know? Not even little lies. It just hurt. They sting me. They sting me. Something happened that was different from within. But yes, I didn't, I didn't explore all religions. I didn't read lots of books. It was an experience, an experience that happened to me. Then it matured through my reading, and then it that wasn't just an isolated verse. Remember, unlike almost all Christians, I read the entire Bible many, many times through and developed it, and it got more and more faith. I, I, I'll, I'll give you a, an instance. One day there was this discussion. I was with some guys in college. I was just an undergraduate in college, and they were talking about demons. And I turned to them. I said, you believe in demons? And they said, well, Jesus spoke about demons all the time. I said, you know, you're right. Jesus apparently believed in demons. He was always confronted by demons. Then I started reading the scriptures. And my thoughts changed. My views changed. To believe in Adam and Eve, that God created fully formed man and woman, I didn't believe in that when I first got saved. But remember, the, the threshold for salvation in Christianity is confessing that Jesus is Lord, believing that he's risen from the dead. That I believed in. On that day, November 7, 1977, I can't understand it. That's a hard one. You know, even, even to this day, sometimes a, a Christian students will come up to me because, you know, I'm the, I'm the token Christian professor on campus. And they'll say, uh, there's a professor there in the religion department. We think he's a Christian, but we're not sure. So I say, okay, I'll find out for you. So I, I invite them to the faculty club, and as soon as we sit down, I say, do you believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ? Because... For me, that's what the scriptures say. That, that's the threshold. That's what you got to believe. And then if they say, oh, physical resurrection, no, no, no. So then I know. All right? <laughs> then I know. Because that's the threshold. Or if they say, oh, yeah. You know, and I've done it with lots of professors. Not just religion professors, lots of professors. So, yes, was it simple? Yes. Is, was it, you know, did I scan every faith? No. Did I scan every thought? Did I go, you know, read the Gita and the... the you know, and, and, and study Taoism and study Islam. No, I didn't. You know, I came out of an expression of, of Judaism, which is very secular. And I had, I had remembered asking questions of rabbis and getting no answer. And, and my Jewish friends, who I'm very close to, and especially Orthodox Jews in Israel, because I go there a lot. My daughter lives there, and I, I've spoken all over Israel many, many times. Um, you know, they just weep that some rabbis didn't engage an inquisitive young mind. Uh, and I think Christians, you, you know, pay the same price when, when Christian officials are asked, you know, certain questions that they don't take it more seriously and explain it from the scriptures. But that's where I am. But yeah, and, and it's, it's, it's a relationship. Now I feel as if I know God, he knows me and I love him. He loves me. Is that, is that okay? Okay, we'll run with it. It's more like a personal question, but after accepting Jesus as a Lord and Savior, have you ever come to the point like your face got weakened and struggled? Oh, your face got weakened and struggled and thought, yeah, weakened. yeah, and thought about the God existence. Have you ever experienced? Because it sounds like you're always like strong in face, and you know you're always like, yeah, sure about it. You know, I, I, my wife is here, so she can, she, she can tell you better than I. Um, you, you know, sometimes I can be so moody, she says to me that I should join the Moody Bible Institute. <laughs> so, so, yes, I have struggles, I have doubts, I have fears, but, but I've never turned back. But I have the struggles, and, you know, I have the, the same pains, and sometimes you would think, you would think that after 35 years, 
I would have it all figured out, that I would stop sinning and I would do what's right and never have a doubt. One would think so. You know, after a while, how long does it take to learn? You know, it takes you four years to get a PhD. I mean, isn't 35 years long enough? But I'm just not there yet. Maybe next year. All right. Uh, let's say put uh, Y axis as a secular success for the faculty, maybe number of grant, uh, citation, uh, any success. Or for the students, maybe GPA, uh, number of papers from their studies, and X axis as the, uh, their belief. And what kind of function do you see? And uh, what can you tell about uh, those who with a high X value and low Y value? You know, you know th this is, th that, that is really a great question. I've never heard it put that way. <laughs> but I, I will tell you, we are not monolithic. You know, the scriptures say that, that some women received back their dead by resurrection, and others were tortured, not accepting their release, that they might attain a better resurrection. Others were stoned. Others were tortured. Others were chained. Others were sawn in two, imprisoned, wandered in caves and hills and holes in the ground, men of whom the world was not worthy. Everybody has a different lot. You know, not everybody is going to be academically good. And just because God really blessed my work, he might have something totally different for somebody else, but you will be blessed. There is, there, it, there is scriptural promises that there is blessing by meditating on the scriptures. There are promises for that. If you meditate on the scriptures, you will be blessed. It says it over and over again. It doesn't say how you're going to be blessed. You may be, die next week, but you'll die blessed. I don't know, but everybody has a different lot. But that is what I believe, because you're asking me what, what I believe about this function. Um, uh, but I, too, have seen, seen, seen struggles. You, you know, I, I work in an institution that not as fine as this great institution, but, you know, we, we have some good students, too. And, and um, I have children as well. And not all my children are just off scale academically. Some of them struggle, and to have a struggling child academically has made me a much more merciful professor. <laughs> you know, you're looking at a guy, I always put a scripture verse at the top of every exam. I've done it since I was an assistant professor, but students love to put a verse on the top of their exams when they give them back, and it's, blessed are the merciful. <laughs> But when I have a struggling child, it's made me a much better professor because I realize not everybody is cut for the same thing. But there is a special place. And what I try to identify with students often is if they're miserable in organic chemistry, I said, you know, I'm not sure that pre-med is for you. Why do you want to be a physician? Well, you know, my mom has always wanted me to be it. I said, what do you like? Well, I love English literature. I said, well, why don't you do that and become a professor of English literature? They're, you think I could? I really could? I said, yeah, you could. You can do it. <laughs> and I see them a month later, and they are happy. And they're carrying you know, these huge anthologies of just, and they love it. So what I try to do with students is to, to even, in an academic sense, find out what is it that you like and do that, because it's miserable doing in life what you don't like. If I, I love to go to work. I love my office. I tell my wife, I come home because I'm tired and because I'm hungry. <laughs> or else I would just stay at work. I wouldn't even notice I'm there. I love it that much. <clears throat> Find what you love to do and do it. And I like to encourage them in that direction. And as far as faith, go as far as you can go. Go as far as you can go. I don't know if I've answered your question, but I'm trying. Um, so this question may appear accusatory, um, but it's really an honest question. Um, so it appears from psychology that human beings tend to be very good pattern finders. And so how do you respond to someone that would say that simply after you were exposed to a new set of ideas, you reinterpreted all your experiences in light of those ideas and then came to faith, and so all of your stories of having, of 
God answering your prayers. That's simply an interpretation of your experiences through this new lens. That's a really good question, you know, and, and, and that's not a question that I have an answer to. You may well be right. You may well be right. I don't have an answer for that. A lot of what I have is an experience. And whether, could this experience be from a reinterpretation, as you say? I don't have an answer for that. And I'm not sure how I could have an answer for that. Um, there is historical proof, historical proof, for the things that are written in the Bible. It's not something that I can put under a microscope, but it's something that you would use as in the sense of a legal proof. So it's not based on a bunch of fantasies about the things that are written, about the things that, that are, are seen in, in my own life. You know, we are complex organisms with an amazing capacity, and I don't think that I have a sufficient answer for you. Is it, is it all right for, for one to say, I don't know? Okay. Um, from the introduction video, there was a three ideas are um, based on college system. Um, one, one of them was like how we are accepting different values. Like your truth can be different, different from my truth. Like, so people ha can have different religions, right? But do you think is that okay to enforce the idea of what is our, like, what is my truth is? Or do you think it is okay to accepting every different value? You know, I, I have to go back to what Jesus said. Um, Jesus said, this is not my words. This is the words of Jesus, the one whom I follow, said, I am. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through me. That seems more exclusive than we like to hear in our current day society. But Jesus said that. I didn't. It's not my job to convert anybody. It's not my job. Only the Holy Spirit could do that. You know, I can't convert a, a person. All I can do is say, look at what's happened in my life. There's no doubt. I mean, there's a whole lot of people in this world from other religions and other faiths, and, and I know a lot of them, and I find them wonderful human beings. And I think there'd be a lot more Christians in the world if Christians started acting like Christians. Um, but I have to go back to the words of the one whom I follow, and that's what he said. It seemed pretty exclusive that people get to God. But I, I, I will tell you, and this is something that bothers my evangelical friends. But remember, I'm a Jew, so I can, I can get away with things. He, he, the scriptures say, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that he's risen from the dead, you shall be saved. So I know the way. You do that, you'll be saved. But what's interesting is that Paul didn't say in the next verse, and if you don't, you won't. He didn't say that. So I don't know. I have no idea who's going to hell. I can tell you for sure, based on my understanding of the scriptures, who's going to heaven. Believing that Jesus is Lord and confessing that and believing in the physical resurrection of the dead. I have no idea who's not going, but I believe in a God who knows, and that's up to him. I have enough trouble with nano cars and things like that. <laughs> he makes those decisions, and that's up to him, and uh, that's in his hands. This, this one better be good. <laughs> In your experience studying uh, nanotechnology and nanocars, have you ever come into contact with people who have beliefs that 
uh, do not require Jesus Christ for an explanation of creation and life. Um, and what are the arguments that you've heard, and what is really what can what makes you consistently believe what you believe scientifically? Okay, so so I'm I'm, I'm going to repeat the question. So I I sure I, in my study of nanocars, have I come across people that had different philosophies on life and where life came from, and how did I handle that? Oh yeah, so, so do I, yeah, I mean, I mean, this is my life. Everybody, almost everybody that I deal with doesn't believe that Jesus Christ is necessary for life and existence. That's a vast majority of people. So the question is, have I ever found anybody else that believes what I believe? <laughs> the answer's a few. All right. What are the, what are the arguments that they bring to me? Um, I, I, I mean, sort of the arguments that have been brought to me today. I mean, there are other faiths, there are other ways of thinking about this, and, and uh, they believe in evolution, and I'm okay with that. I mean, this is, this is for them. And, you know, one of the things that I go back to is if they're reasonable folks, I mean, it's okay. What I don't understand is when they get, when they have to start really getting down on Christianity and saying it's for a bunch of idiots and it's, it's for stupid people and it's, it's uh, silliness. And, and generally when students will tell me, you know, this professor says Christians are stupid and they're idiots and, and, and Christianity is a bunch of nonsense, then so often I just say to them, okay, go and find out from this professor whether they're married and whether their spouse really likes them and really whether their children like them. Because if they have to spend their time dissing Christianity, they're probably not happy people. And probably people don't like being around them. And children generally don't like being around parents, like grown children don't like being around parents like that. And Think about whether you want to be like that professor. I'm much happier with, you know, people think that Christianity is irrelevant. You know, just leave it alone. And they don't have to bother with it. And I can understand. I mean, they're going about their life and they're going about their way. And sometimes I'll talk with them and I might share my faith with them. They say, hey, great, great, Jim, that's fine. And we're friends. I love them. I mean, they're good folks. So I, I don't know that people come to me with great profound arguments any more than what I've heard here. And uh, they're good questions and they're interesting arguments, but um, you know, maybe I could have characterized them if I had been a theologian. You know, then I would, I would pigeonhole them and I could go through all the basic arguments. And theologians know them all, and I'm sure you can find some website that has them all, but I, I haven't done that, okay? <laughs> Yeah, so um, I'm really jealous because you've got to see so many different cultures, which is really cool. And so I guess I have two questions. The first one is uh, how, uh, as far as like planting the seeds, as far as uh, the Jews in Israel and whenever you went to the prisons and taught those people to your colleagues, to students, which group uh, is, has a tendency to accept scriptures more and uh, understand the ideas more? And then my second one, which is not relevant to the first one, is just uh, whenever Paul says to pray always in the New Testament, I was curious what uh, you think about that and how that kind of plays out in your life. Okay, so, so as far as praying always, I mean, I, I pray all the time. I'm driving, I'm praying, I'm asking God and praying to God and praising Him. So, you know, that, that's what I think it is, and I need to do it even more often. I mean, it's a blessed thing to do it, and it, it uh, you know, when your mind is stayed on Him, it'll take you out of a lot of depression and and being anxious, that's for sure. And, and when I'm really depressed, like last week, I mean, last week was really a depressing week for me because I had a couple of big blows hit me at work. And, and uh, uh, you know, I, I had to consciously say, you know, I'm going to dwell on the Lord. And that really picked me up and got me out of it. Now, as far as uh, which, which demographic of people grabbed onto the scriptures the most, um, you know, I, I think that in your college years, if you don't take hold of Christianity and really grasp hold of it in your college years, beyond that it becomes more difficult. So college students are a particularly open group 
to at least hearing and thinking about these sort of things is it's not because people get, get mad and ugly as they get older. It's that there's so many burdens in life that start taking over. You got this screaming kid and you got the car payment, you got the house payment and your spouse is doing this. And you, there's so many things coming at you in life. And I understand that, peop, that students think that they're the busiest individuals in the world, that nobody works as hard as they do. And I understand that. But the amount of things that come at, at, at people in life, just the baggage in life that starts accumulating in broken relationships and hurts and, and abuse and physical abuse and, 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 and sexual abuse and all these things start piling up, it makes it harder sometimes to break through into people's lives until they get to the end and they're in a maximum security prison. And then interestingly, they start opening up again. But even that is when they're in prison. When they get out, there's a whole nother set of lifestyle things that hit them. Even when they want to walk well, they now are working at McDonald's for you know six, seven dollars an hour when they were selling drugs and making two thousand dollars a day and couldn't even hold on to their money with that kind of money. And now they're making seven dollars an hour. And you, you got you, you know some you know former wife or former girlfriend's pulling on you and, and, and government coming after you for child payments, and it's hard. So, so um, uh, I think college students, it's a particularly good time to hear. You said before that you knew a lot of scientists that said they never believed in God and whatnot, and, and I'll just had something to say about that. Have they ever tried them before? You know, <laughs> because the thing about it is you can't sit there and say you don't like something and you've never tried it before in your life. You don't like Coca-Cola, but you never tasted it before in your life. And so what I'm saying is there's a lot of scientists out there. That's one of my things, you know, scientists in order to have a hypothesis, you gotta have a hypothesis and in order to see if the hypothesis is true, you have to take action on it by doing the necessary steps to prove it. And have they taken hypothesis on Jesus Christ and have they taken those necessary steps to prove him? And so that's the real question for the guy right there, that, whoever made the question about, you know, have you ever met a lot of people that refute Christianity? I met a Christian or an atheist before that was a Christian before, and he said, you know, he tried Jesus Christ before and yada, 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 they didn't need him then, don't need him now. And I asked him, you know, do you take those steps that were necessary? Do you just pray and hope or do you pray and believe that you already had? You know what I mean? And he just, he just closed his mouth. Too many people want to, the benefits of it but they don't want the actions and the work behind it, you know, and I just want to say that to y'all here today. Whoever is not saved, you know, you can't sit there and just hope and believe. You got to get saved and, and try Jesus Christ, you know what I mean? It's impossible for God to lie, you know, so, you know, if you try him today, he will not leave you forsake you. Don't go through life trying to do it by yourself when the one who's already created you knows the beginning and knows the end already has the steps for you, so why try to make him yourself? You know, but I just had to make that comment on there. So thank you, thank you, I appreciate that, I really do. You know, it's interesting, Rick Smalley, being a Nobel Prize winner, he, he was a guy who would make a lot of jokes about Christianity, and one, one day he and I were on a flight together, we were sitting right next to each other, and we were on our way to, to speak to, to uh, the CEO of Intel, and Andy Grove, one of the founders of Intel, was going to be there, and so the whole, the whole upper group of Intel, and we were riding on the airplane, and he turns to me and says, Jim, do you really believe all that stuff in the Bible? And I said, I think I do. He says, well, good. Finally, I got someone with a brain that I can ask some questions. So for two hours, he just asked questions, and I just answered them as best I could. And then after the two hours, he said, you know, you know why you spoke to me? I said, what do you mean? He says, you spoke to me because you're really a Jew. If you'd have been a Baptist, you'd have just said, well, that's just the way it is. <laughs> <laughs> and I had, a, I had a book in my bag called God in the Dock by C.S. Lewis that I was reading at the time, and so I handed it to him. He went to his room that night. He came down in the morning having read the whole book and handed it back to me. He says, this guy is an amazing mind. So when we got back to, to Rice, I bought him about four or five books, uh, C.S. Lewis books and a mere, mere Christianity and a 
book by Hugh Ross, and he devoured them, just devoured them. And uh, um, about a year later, he came to Christ, gave his life to Christ. And it was really a, a profound profound change. And he started changing his behavior. He started changing the way he spoke. He actually only gave, gave a lecture at a university and talked about the intercession of God and life and the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And, and uh, um, he only lived about a year after that. Uh, he died of leukemia. And I actually took the Lord's Supper with him an hour before he passed away. And uh, so I've seen lives change. And, and that's actually right. You know, when I get scientists that will really open up to me, a lot of them will say, yeah, you know, I grew up in a Christian home. I had another Nobel Prize winner. I sat with him and I talked with him for a while. I asked him if he believed in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. He says, you know, Jim, I wish that I could believe that. He was a man just, just wanting to believe. And it turned out that his grandfather had been a minister and he had learned things as a, as a kid. And, and uh, so scientists sometimes are like anybody else. We put up an aura on the outside like, yeah, I know that, you know. But it, we're just, we're just, we have the same insecurities as everybody else, and we don't have all the answers. And the unfortunate thing is that, that young people think we have all the answers, and we really understand, and we really don't. At least, I really don't. Um, you probably have a lot of uh, examples but for this question, but um, I figure you've been doing this for a while and being a Christian for a while, so you probably have a lot of examples. But I was just wondering uh, if you had some you could share with us about um, like things that you've seen in chemistry or your nano cars or any of that stuff, and you're just like, that's God right there. Like, this is huge. That's so cool. God, that's you. <laughs> You know, this is a great question. This is part of the reason why I love science. I mean, it, so many times I see things and see the way molecules will come together, the things that they do, and particularly in biological systems, and you're just amazed. So I'll, I'll tell you what happens in my mind. I'm walking around. Everybody sees a tree. I see this leaf, and in my mind's eye, immediately, I project to a, mag, a, manganese, a, a magnesium atom sitting in a porphyrin, and photons of light funneling in and hitting that, and then electrons releasing and starting the photosynthetic process. This is what's happening. <laughs> and, and I want to shake this person next to me. So do you, look at this. Because in my mind's eye, this is what's happening. Sometimes I'm, I'm looking at people, and as I'm talking to them, I'm looking right into their eye and imagining what's happening in their brain, these neurons that are firing as I'm speaking. And they, they don't know why I'm just piercing right into their eye. Because I'm really fascinated by this stuff. Um, so, yeah, I see God in so much. But what's interesting is that if you look, for example, of the structure of DNA under a microscope, it does not say in the Hebrew alphabet, God was here. So I can understand why my colleagues, it, it doesn't do the same for them that it does for me, because I'm coming from a different view now. And I'm coming now from a different worldview that's been constructed through my meditation on scriptures and reading the Bible and being in this context for a long time. I understand that. But that, that, is, that is really what, what I see. I, I get excited, just like you do. I get really excited. And when one of our nano cars starts moving, I am pumped. I am just, just ready. And, and I, you know, I would start showing things to people. I remember bringing things to Rick Smalley's office and just showing them and just, look at that. I said, Rick, this is better than anything you've ever done in your life. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for coming here and uh, doing something which I think is really very brave. I mean, rarely do you have people that can speak so eloquently and um, I mean, it, it, thank you. I really appreciate you coming here today. Um, the reason uh, I, I have... <laughs> I'm curious, you know, um, in your journey, you know, as you're, as you're going through your path and your walk and your, and your faith, you've, you've spent a lot of time reading the Bible. Um, one of the challenges that I know I certainly face sometimes is when you encounter... Uh, particular passages or aspects of the word that 
it's just hard to square sometimes. Like, uh, I'm sure because you said you've, you've read the Bible so many times, you've encountered uh, perhaps inconsistencies or things. Some, sometimes they can be inaccuracies, just little things that, that happen as a result of the way the Bible was put together. I'm curious if there are any specific ones that you struggle with as you go through the Bible. Are there still some things that kind of do kind of a sort of give you sort of a mental glitch as a result of that? Um, not really, actually, not really. You know, when people say to me, oh, the Bible's full of inaccuracies, I say, show me three. Ah, oh, well, you know, it's, it's all over there. I say, okay, show me three. It's full of them, so find me three. So there, there's not a whole lot of inaccuracies here. And, and we do have a translation because it wasn't written in, in English. And, and, uh, um, but like I said, you know, you, you, you talk about days before there was a sun. You know, this, this is... It's hard to understand. Now, I have a son-in-law who's a Messianic Jew, meaning he's a Jew who believes that Jesus is the Messiah like me, and he was born and raised in Israel, my son-in-law. And he looks at the book of Genesis after studying this in Hebrew, and he's like, this is just such great poetry. This doesn't disturb him a bit, you know, because he's saying it's written poetically rather than scientifically, you know, and he looks at me oddly, like, look at how the scientists live the scriptures. Um, and I'm okay with that. I've, I have this implicit faith through this relationship. And, and generally, if I really want... All right, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. There is nothing that's been written in the Old Testament or the New Testament that Jews or Catholics have not thought about for thousands of years. All the little problems I think there might be there, all the little things they say, look at that, look what I found. You look it up. The Jews or the Catholics saw it first. And this is because you get... You get People that sit in rooms for thousands of years looking at every little nuance of every little thing, they've thought through every permutation of everything, and they come up with a lot of good answers for this. So if you're willing to study it, there's lots of good solutions for this, both from Judaism for the Old Testament and Catholics from the Old and the New Testament, because for thousands of years they've been working on this thing. And uh, uh, there's really nothing new under the sun. So... It doesn't bother me very much, and usually with a few clicks on Google, I can usually find, you know, some answers to things. So, no, it doesn't upset me at all. But thank you. Oh, and, and one other thing. It, it, it's, it, it's really not that brave, you know. There are, there are people in other countries that are really brave. The Bible says, you have never shed any blood for your faith, and that's me. Nobody's ever hit me, nobody's ever... So, so I've never shed any blood... I don't have to worry about getting shot or be thrown in jail after this event. The heroes are the people who have gone before us and the people in Pakistan and in Saudi Arabia and in other places that do this sort of thing. They're the real heroes. I also want to thank you, sir, because this has been awesome. Um, my question was that I have a good friend who I've got to know recently. Uh, who's also Jewish, and I have no doubt that he knows that, you know, I believe in Jesus Christ. But I've talked to him, invited him to church, and talked to the gospel, but haven't had much success. So I didn't know you, being Jewish, if you knew anything that I might be able to talk to him that might be successful. You know, uh, uh, there's a book that Jesus was a Jew that works very well. It, it's unfortunate because the rabbis have taught Jews against Jesus. It's not that they're coming with a clean slate, a neutral slate on this. And it's also things written about Jesus from the Talmud. I mean, that it's even there. Uh, not much, but a few things are written uh, uh, and that are not very complimentary. Uh, so one of the things that probably made it easier for me is that I was so secular, and so I didn't have much on my mind from what the rabbis had taught me. In fact, I I'd never paid much attention in, in synagogue. Um, so, so it was easier, but I, I think that, that Jesus was a Jew is a good book and a good starter for somebody who might have an open mind. The other thing that really is scary to a Jew is this, is Isaiah chapter 53. Now, Jews will read the, the, the five, first five books, the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses, the first five books of our Bible are read every day, every Sabbath day in a synagogue. So they'll work their way through those five books. Then they'd read a complementary portion from some other text. 
there's a portion that they don't read. And most Jews will say, oh, no, we read it, we read it. They don't. It's not on the, on the list. And that portion is Isaiah 53, the end of Isaiah 52 and Isaiah 53. And I have sat with Orthodox Jews, and I will start reading it in English, and they will read it along with me in the Hebrew Bible. And we'll get halfway through Isaiah 53, which is such a clear picture of the crucifixion of Jesus, his suffering, his dying, that they'll say, stop, that's enough. And that's in their own Bible. You just read Isaiah 53 to a Jew out of your Bible. They'll say, oh, that's your New Testament. You say, no, that's the Old Testament. Oh, that's your English Bible. That's it. You have them read it in their Bible. You read it in yours. And it's overwhelming. Now, that's if they have some construct for what it is to really be a Jew and the Scriptures mean something to them. But there's a lot of Jews that are a lot, a lot like a lot of Christians that have never read the Bible. And so you read Isaiah 53, and it does nothing because there's no construct to really get a hook into them in, in, in that way. Does that help a little bit? Okay. I was wondering if since you became a believer, you connected more with your Jewish roots. Yes, I connected a lot more with my Jewish roots since becoming a believer. I never read the scriptures as a Jew, and now I read them over and over and over again. And, and it, what's interesting is, you know, many Jews will say, oh, you're not a Jew anymore. But Orthodox Jews, when I talk to them, they weep, not because I became a, a Christian. Like, like I, I went to a woman's office, I was brought to her office just to discuss chemistry at the Technion one day. And she said, I just got done reading your website. And on my website, I say, I'm a Messianic Jew. And, and I said, well, then maybe you don't like me. She says, no, 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 I have an open mind, but she's an Orthodox Jew. And we talked for about an hour about the scriptures, just the Old Testament, just talked for an hour. And she started crying. She started weeping. I said, why are you weeping? She said, in my Judaism, I have to light this candle, say this prayer, do this, do this. She said, you read the scriptures just because you love it. I wish that I had the opportunity to do that. She said, I envy what you have. Well, then I was t talking to another Orthodox Jew at another, another university one day. I said, you know what so-and-so said? She said she envied what I have in the way I read the scriptures. He's an Orthodox Jewish professor, chemistry professor also. He said, I envy you too. He said, after I met you and we had our first conversation, I went back to my synagogue and I told them that I'm not going to read the... the, the uh, Talmud anymore, until I re go back to the Constitution, until I read the Tanakh, the Old Testament, and read it like this guy reads it. And so what it's done, it's like Paul says that when you share, you are going to move them to jealousy by your love for God. And this is what happens with Orthodox Jews, because there's a construct in which they wholly respect the scriptures. And then when we start talking and engaging, they invite me into their homes for Shabbat. And I talk and they invite their friends and their family. And I just talk. And here's this Messianic Jew with this Western construct and meeting with them. And it's just, just this harmony. And I'll say, Wait. And, and, and I'll point things out that they never thought about. And, so, and, and they point things out to me that I never thought about. So we have a rich time together. But yes, the, the coming to the Lord has really enhanced my Jewishness. Um, there are probably a lot of other questions, but we're way past time. So um, could you please join me in thanking Dr. Jim Tor one more time? For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at veritas.org.